this is Mr. Coates and this is Apes Lecture number 14 on weather. When we talk about weather, we want to look at patterns across land masses. Um, this is the most important weather that we're concerned with. Normally, on if you watch a daily weather forecast, you see a map similar to this with H's and L's and these funky little symbols in blue and red. So it's a good idea to know what these symbols mean, but also know what causes these phenomena. Now one of the problems is people often get the terms weather and climate confused. Okay? Weather is the day-to-day -day thing that's happening uh, in the atmosphere around you. So weather is different in different parts of the world on the same day at the same time. So that is weather. Now climate is different. Climate is the average weather in an area over a period of time and usually it's over a year or two. So that is climate. And so a lot of people get these messed up, especially the media. The media confuse these things all the time. And so what they do, and politicians do this as well, is that they confuse it with things like this. And they say that one daily weather event or maybe one season's worth of heavy snowfall debunks the idea of climate change. Or they say that one major tropical storm proves climate change. And so this is a major mistake that people or media and politicians often make and confuse climate with weather. So we don't want to make that mistake. Alright, so how does air pressure play into this? In the last lecture we talked about what air pressure was. What happens is that air pressure causes winds to form. As I said earlier, winds flow from a high pressure area where water, where air is actually pushing down on the planet. Where you get low pressure you actually have air lifting up off of the planet. This um, air that descends on the planet in a low pre in a high pressure area basically warms as it descends and because of that it takes energy away from it and inhibits the forms of formation of clouds. So usually a high pressure means a sunny area. During the summer here in Florida we usually have large areas of high pressure that stay over the, the state and keep us from getting cold fronts from the north. These high pressure areas often block low pressure areas. So as I said, in high pressure the atmosphere is actually moving down toward the surface of the planet. Air slowly descends, usually um, it flows counterclockwise. Whereas in a low pressure we actually have air moving away from the Earth's surface. Now it rises and cools and when this happens usually this warm air down here is full of water and when it cools then we get all kinds of rain. Alright so this brings us to fronts. We talk about fronts, we're talking about temperature associated with them but they're actually caused because of high and low pressure. So when you see a weather map on the news you'll see symbols. So you get an H here for a high pressure area and you get lows here or L's for low pressure areas. Now remember, the winds like to go from the high pressure to the low pressure. However, usually with a low pressure is when you get a cold front here. This is a cold front. And you can tell that with this, these triangles here is a cold front. moving, And it's typically moving in the direction of the arrows. The arrows show movement of this cold front. And so even though the winds are going towards this front, the front is actually going this direction. And what happens is that the warm, humid air created by this high pressure actually goes underneath the cold air and that's where we get thunderstorms. And so thunderstorms are usually occur around these low pressure areas. And so if we were to live right here in Arkansas somewhere, we could probably expect thunderstorms within the next 24 hours at this location. Now, warm fronts often come from the south and move towards the north in the United States. And uh, we see those a lot here in Florida because as a cold front comes through, sometimes it turns into this type of front here called a stationary front. And then it will turn into a warm front and move back up. So a lot of times we'll see a cold front pass us by and then turn into a stationary front and then come back as a warm front here in Florida. So these fronts are very important. And once again, high pressure is associated with very sunny, uh, very nice days where a low pressure is usually uh, a sign of storms to come or rain and usually right after low pressure we get high pressure again so high pressure moves into this area and usually the day after a big storm in the Midwest is usually a very sunny uh, very clear sky day it might be very cold but it's usually a very nice day after a very large uh, low pressure system goes through 
So here's what happens when we get a low pressure system coming through. If we look at it, the actual clouds here, this is how thunderstorms build up. We have the cold winds coming in this way. And then, as I said before, we have this high pressure out here that creates a high uh, warm winds in this area. So these warm, moist air then gets trapped up. Then we form this triangle here of cold air. It's called a wedge. And it's wedge cold air, and it moves this way, forcing the warm air up. And then this basically creates clouds. And if we get a lot of energy in this area, we get very large thunderstorms that can produce things like tornadoes. And uh, so these are uh, what we call thunderheads, and uh, could be called anvil clouds as well, because they get these large protrusions at the very top, where they start reaching the very tops of the, therm the troposphere. Now what's the connection between weather and biology? As we talked about previously is that uh, the weather or the climate in an area controls the types of plants you see there. And then the plants then bring in the types of animals that you see. Let's look at some severe weather here, tropical cyclones. We live in an area where we get tropical cyclones almost every year. Here in Florida we have hurricanes. Uh, in the Pacific, we call them typhoons, but they're basically tropical cyclones. This is a, what happens when we get a large low pressure system and the uh, winds start uh, circling around that low. So we get this low and we start getting these large circulation of winds around these lows and these pick up lots of moisture. And we start getting large cloud formations are found and then the rush of air into this area here creates high wind gusts. And cyclones are characterized by having winds over 75 miles an hour. Now this is Hurricane Charlie, and the center of this hurricane is right about here. A path of the hurricane here is supposed to go right up into Tampa Bay. However, Hurricane Charlie took a major turn right here in uh, Charlotte Harbor and went right up Charlotte Harbor instead and up this direction. This was a near miss for Tampa Bay. If this thing uh, would have came up into Tampa Bay, we would have had billions of dollars worth of damage in Tampa Bay. Uh, thankfully, it did not come here. Unfortunately, it did hit Charlotte Harbor pretty hard. All right, other severe weather that can happen, I mentioned tornadoes in the Midwest. The Midwest is known as Tornado Alley, usually up through Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas, Missouri, parts of Arkansas, usually where most of the tornadoes in the country occur. And the United States is about the only place on the planet where we get lots of tornadoes. The United States has a particular climate system set up with the Gulf of Mexico that really makes it uh, a place for tornadoes to form. So this is a tornado here. It's probably a water spout over Lake Okeechobee here. Um, and But this is an awesome picture showing you the actual funnel cloud here. But tornadoes can be very destructive. Um, if you look, this aerial here, this is aerial was shot in uh, 2012, shortly after a large uh, tornado came through the town of Joplin. So if we look right in this area here of the aerial, there's this swath of damage in this area. And this tornado killed over 100 people. A lot of people uh, died in this tornado because they just didn't have adequate shelter. There weren't enough houses with basements. And houses were just ripped from their foundations, and there was hardly anything left. Entire schools were uh, blown away, and so it was a huge uh, damaging storm for the, the city of Joplin, Missouri. And uh, the uh, city still has this huge swath. If you look at today's aerials, it still has a swath of damage in here. They're starting to rebuild, but you can uh, definitely still see this on an aerial. Cloud cover also has effect on weather. Obviously, clouds bring uh, precipitation. However, clouds also block some of the sun's rays and reflect the energy back into the uh, into space. So, the more clouds we have on the planet, the less solar energy we have. However, if we lack clouds, then our solar energy intensifies. Now, the effect of these clouds reflecting energy back into space is called albedo. And albedo is an important thing to, to know about because the more clouds we have, the more albedo have, the less energy that is uh, focused on the planet. And so this plays into a huge effect when we talk about climate change a little bit later, is that how much effect does this have? And if we say climate change is creating more storms, then doesn't that negate the climate change? If we create more clouds, then we'll have more albedo, and so we won't get major warming. That's all a big argument that's out there. Another thing that causes albedo is ice caps and snow. These are highly reflective, and so the albedo in these areas is 
uh, high. And you can kind of see that in the, this graphic here with those areas that are frozen have the highest levels of albedo and then areas that don't have reflective surfaces, uh, they have the lowest albedos. Now, notice in this area, we have high albedo, and this is because this area is the desert, and it's all sand, and sand's a very good reflector of the sun's energy as well. Even though it's really hot here, this reflects a lot of light. One major weather phenomenon that happens every once in a while, and there's no predicting it, is called El Nino, also known as the El Nino Southern Oscillation, or ENSO event. This occurs down in the, uh, in the eastern Pacific, and uh, we have a little graphic up here. This is uh, South America here, uh, South America here, and up here is North America. And uh, so what happens is that the normal currents that occur, normally in this area, the current wraps this way, and it's a cold current that comes up from the uh, Antarctic and creates normal upwelling in this area, and fisheries are often high in this area. There's a lot of good fishing that often happens. However, during an El Nino event, this actually backs up. The warm water that collects on this side actually backs up. The current reverses, and so you get this huge warm water bloom in this area, and uh, uh, the upwelling stops, so you don't get a high primary productivity happening, and the fishing dies, basically. This also can control weather patterns throughout the entire globe. So major weather changes happen when uh, El Nino occurs. I encourage you, the graphic stopped here, but I encourage you to play this slide, this rewind this, and look at how the ocean temperatures change as we go through the El Nino event. The last weather phenomenon I'd like to talk about is the rain shadow effect, which is a type of microclimate. What happens on a windward side of a mountain range, the warm, moist air gets pushed up, and as it gets pushed up, the moisture in it condenses and starts to fall as precipitation. So the windward side of the mountain is highly uh, wet, and this is a uh, perfect example in California and Washington, Oregon, when you get to the Sierra Nevada mountains. So the Pacific side of the Sierra Nevada mountains is nice and wet. However, once you get over the Sierra Nevada mountains, the air mass then has basically been wrung out. Uh, the atmosphere rises as it goes over the mountains, and all the precipitation comes out of the air mass. And by the time the air mass gets on the other side of the mountain here, it's all dry. And so this is why we have the desert southwest in Nevada and Arizona. Uh, this is on the leeward side of the mountain here, and so it doesn't get hardly any rain. Well, I hope that was helpful in helping you understand the differences between weather and climate. Don't forget to have the question that you want answered or you don't understand in class in your notebook when these notes are due.